Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jose David Saldivar, and I'm the director for the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, CCSRE, and a professor in the Department of Comparative Literature. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this year's Anne and Lauren Keeves Distinguished Lecture, our 10th, and it's a great uh, time to celebrate today. Our CCSRE Kiva lectures tend to be something of an event in our field, that field being not only the comparative study of race and ethnicity in America, but also multicultural studies impinging on America and the world. The Kiva lectures have impact, cause discussion, and provoke lots of debate. So I'm sure that today's speaker will meet all of those great things. Each year our center brings to Stanford a notable scholar, writer, or public intellectual to deliver a lecture pertaining to vital issues relating to race and ethnicity more broadly in our country. The Anne and Lauren Distinguished Speakers Fund endows this lecture. I'm delighted that Anne and Lauren Keeve are with us this afternoon and I'd like to acknowledge them and Let's give them a round of applause. The Anne and Lauren Keeve Distinguished Lecture is one public aspect of CCSRE that seeks to address social, cultural, and global questions about race and ethnicity and research and teaching at Stanford and to motivate our students and colleagues to take these questions up as engaged and activist citizens. Over the past 10 years, we've assembled a terrific range of thinkers, writers, and artists to address the problems and challenges of our cross-racial multiculture in the United States. And today, the Anne and Lauren Keeve Distinguished Lecture is, I think, one of the most prestigious lectures at Stanford University. Our past speakers have included Drs. Lonnie Bunch, Melissa Hayward Lacewell, Glenda Carpio, Lawrence Bobo, Claude Steele, Lonnie Guineer, and Gerald Torres, as well as the National Book Award and Pulitzer Prize winning writers Maxine Hong Kingston, Navarro Scott Mamaday, and Juno Diaz. And today's distinguished Skiva speaker is Nancy Cantor, Chancellor, Rutgers University, New York. What a great way to celebrate our 10th anniversary. And I know that Nancy's gonna give us a good talking to about the public university and the role of the university. I will now introduce the moderator for today's event, Professor Anthony Leasing Antonio. And after my brief introduction, I'll ask a Professor Antonio to come to the podium to introduce our speaker, Chancellor Nancy Cantor. Dr. Anthony Leasing Antonio is Associate Professor of Education in the Graduate School of Education and Associate Director of the Stanford Institute for Higher Education Research at Stanford. He is also the current Director of the Program in Asian American Studies at CCSRE. <laughs> Professor Antonio's research focuses on issues of American higher education, particularly in the areas of stratification and post-secondary access, racial diversity, and its impact on students and institutions. Most recently, he was selected to the inaugural cohort of the prestigious Spencer Foundation Mid-Career Fellows Program, and I know uh, Professor Antonio is looking forward to having a year off so he can develop these programs. Among his current projects are studies of engineering education and career persistence and college-going culture in schools. So without more further ado, I'd like to ask Professor Antonio to come up to the podium and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Jose David, and good afternoon, everyone. Nancy Cantor is, as Jose David told us, Chancellor of Rutgers University, Newark. Um, I thought perhaps I was chosen to do this introduction because I'm from Newark, but I'm from Newark, California, <laughs> 12 miles that way. Most folks 
thought since my name's Anthony and I was from Newark that I actually am from New Jersey, but I'm not. <clears throat> Previously, uh, uh, Cantor served as chancellor at Syracuse University, chancellor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and provost at the University of Michigan. She received her PhD in psychology right here in 1978 from Stanford University with Ewart Thomas, a good friend of CCSRE. She went on to become a world-class social psychologist and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Chancellor Cantor is widely recognized for bringing forth a new understanding of the role of universities in society that re-emphasizes their public mission. At Syracuse University, she led a new vision for the university called Scholarship in Action. And I want to quote uh, from the Syracuse mission statement uh, because it's completely Chancellor Cantler and, re and, and relevant to her talk today. So Scholarship in Action is, quote, a commitment to forging bold, imaginative, reciprocal, and sustained engagements with our many constituent communities, local as well as global, unquote. In recognition of her efforts, Syracuse was among the first institutions to earn the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teachings classification as a university committed to community engagement. And the Carnegie Corporation of New York granted Cantor the 2008 Carnegie Corporation Academic Leadership Award. She's currently engaged in this kind of institutional transformation work at Rutgers Newark. Cantor has been on the front lines for racial and gender equality in colleges. She was a key player at the University of Michigan's uh, anti-affirmative action cases, Grutter and Gratz, decided in the Supreme Court in 2003. Cantor lectures and writes extensively on the role of universities as what she calls anchor institutions in their communities, along with other issues in higher education, such as rewarding public scholarship, sustainability, liberal education and the creative campus, the status of women in the academy, and racial justice and diversity. She's been recognized for her leadership in these areas by a number of organizations. She's received the Women of Achievement Award from the Anti-Defamation League, the Making a Difference for Women Award from the National Council for Research on Women, the Reginald Wilson Diversity Leadership Award from the American Council on Education, and the Frank W. Hale Jr. Diversity Leadership Award from the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. And we recognize Nancy Cantor here today as our distinguished speaker for the 10th annual Ann and Lauren Kiva Lecture. Please welcome Chancellor Cantor. Thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to be back, and, and I'm very honored to do this lecture. I, I was getting more and more nervous as you were listing the people who've done them before, so I will do my best. Um, so I want to begin today with higher education's promise. Really, there is an increasing, it would seem, shared interest on the part of both private and public institutions to attend to our public mission. This is a welcome sign, as it comes at a time in a global knowledge economy when higher education has a clear role to play as a driver of positive social change. Certainly, we can drive social mobility through education and reshape economic prosperity through innovation. Beyond those critical contributions, we can have impact on our quality of life through collaborations in communities both near and far. To do so, of course, we need to take responsibility for civic life beyond our institutional boundaries. To be good neighbors, moving beyond the geographic meaning of that concept, to embrace its full moral dimensions as a revered Newark, New Jersey, um, not California, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Prince implored in his speech that preceded Dr. King's at the 1963 March on Washington. To realize this promise, though, requires us some self-reflection, starting with some open eyes on the social and political and economic landscape. What do we see and hear when we talk to, and even more importantly, listen to strangers, as Daniel Allen described about an earlier era of the civil rights movement? 
And how do these images reflect back on us as institutions, as potential agents of change today? John Dewey famously reminded an earlier generation that democracy requires tending anew in each generation. But to know how to do that tending, we need to examine our past and our present practices, conditions, habits, and routines. And so that's what I want to talk about today. In that vein of outward reflection, Rupert Nacoste writes poetically in his new volume, Taking on Diversity, that we live amidst what he calls hibernating bigotry, and it may not be hibernating much any longer. Having taught many courses on interpersonal relations and race, he notes with a heavy dose of pain how, and I quote, we stay away from the interpersonal level where bigotry implicates us all. We leave it to our children to carry our baggage on their backs. Baggage they cannot see, but heavy baggage they can feel. Although it is we who have kept it safe and cool, we're stunned when something happens to awaken that resting, hibernating bigotry. We're stunned when a racist song is chanted, sung on a bus filled with young leaders who will help define our future by dint of their privilege. A noose hung on a tree and a barrage of microaggressions surface on college campuses. Stunned when those entrusted with the public safety succumb to a show of overwhelming force in the face of what start as routine encounters but quickly seem to trigger fear on the part of those with and without power. Stunned when the threat of losing out to newcomers provokes xenophobic violence among those stuck themselves in poor black townships post-apartheid. Stunned when walls are erected and locked at night to keep peace between neighbors as decades of discord, grief, and resentment are reinforced anew. We only need to look at images of Belfast, the US border, Selma and Ferguson, Johannesburg, South Africa, to know that we're not done with the ghosts that haunt our social and political landscapes and the hibernating bigotry that threatens our interpersonal relationships. And the dimensions of the ghosts that haunt and the paradoxes with which we routinely live are multifaceted. Consider the fluidity of demographic categories amidst a changing face of diversity and contrast that with the historical dimensions of difference that surface almost automatically to define entrenched biases, such as those that surface in policing contexts as your colleagues Jennifer Eberhardt and Aaliyah Saperstein and others have repeatedly shown. Or the map of geographic mobility defined by transnational migration contrasted with the deeply discouraging temporal arc of populations stuck in place as Patrick Sharkey traces. These ghosts and paradoxes call into question whether the ever presence of easy virtual communication is doing anything to alleviate, or perhaps it exacerbates, the cultural divides in our workplaces and communities as Marcus and Connor so powerfully catalog. How to reconcile the economic and social power of disruptive innovation as modeled every day here in Silicon Valley with the astounding growth of inequality that leaves so many people here and worldwide out of the benefits it reaps whether measured in wealth creation, social mobility through education, or entrepreneurial job growth. This reflection in the looking glass reminds us starkly then of the power of higher education to define winners and losers. As a recent report from the OECD on widening income gaps in countries across the development spectrum underlines, and I quote, Educational attainment is the measure by which people are being sorted into poverty or relative wealth. And I would add, we in the US are failing that test. And arguably, higher education isn't helping matters. So looking specifically at the US, despite what demographer William Fry calls a diversity explosion that is remaking the face of America, 
there are growing disparities in post-secondary attainment. In fact, arguably, we're no longer a country of opportunity for most first-generation poor, black or brown or immigrant children. As is captured in any number of recent indices and reports and headlines, including that of Stanford's own Sean Reardon, who famously titled a New York Times opinion piece, No Rich Child Left Behind. We've fallen in the OEC indices of social mobility through education below many other advanced economies, such that, for example, in the Pell Institute data from 2013, 77% of children from families in the top income quartile attained a bachelor's degree by age 24, and only 9% of those from the lowest income quartile. And those data are strongly skewed by race and ethnicity. And these educational attainment disparities, not surprisingly, carry forward into the job market. Just as one example, McKinsey surveyed in 2014 employment data, and they showed an unemployment rate of 12.4% for black bachelor's degree holders as compared to 5.6% for all the degree holders that they had surveyed. Now, of particular concern is the sorting out of wealth creation in the technology and innovation sector by the continued failure of higher education to attract and retain a diverse talent pool in STEM. Serving as I do on the National Science Foundation Committee on Equal Opportunity in Science and Engineering, I am constantly struck by exactly how little progress we've made in broadening participation in STEM, such that, for example, between 1993 and 2012, less than 20% of bachelors in STEM were awarded to what the foundation categorizes underrepresented minorities, excluding psychology, but psychology, I'm sad to say, was only at 25%, and social sciences at 23%. Contributing, of course, though probably not accounting entirely for the paucity of diversity in the US technology industry, as you are all, I'm sure, very aware of in this region. There have been lots of news stories. The Wall Street Journal, for example, pointed in 2014 to only 6% Hispanic and 3% black employees in the US technology industry, and a scant 28% of women in the industry worldwide. Now, in light, of the rewards of education and employment in STEM, which of course sets the landscape for this, it's not surprising that New York Times columnist Charles Blow questions whether we should worry about a future segregated by science. Indeed, the ever-increasing role of higher education, particularly in STEM fields, but certainly more generally as well, as a central driver of wealth, power, and opportunity in the map of global knowledge economies makes it absolutely imperative that we look squarely at those ghosts of inequality times past and how our current landscape continues to reflect them. I would draw here an imprecise, very imprecise analogy to how bad dreams seem to produce more stress when they repeat the same content night after night. We are repeating the same content night after night. The more talent we continue to lose to prison rather than embracing in higher education, the more hopes we dash in neighborhoods like those in Baltimore or Ferguson, the more we close our borders to today's dreamers. Those reoccurring nightmares of our history will haunt us as a nation and a world. And the more isolated will those who do reap the benefits of higher education become from those who repeatedly do not. In other words, the way we are going, we are solidifying, not resolving, the co-occurrence of a map of opportunity and inequality side by side across the US and beyond. So let me illustrate this haunting paradox of this contemporary landscape and its repetition of old themes by taking a brief dive into the opportunity and inequality map of Newark and northern New Jersey where I live, right across the river from the financial capital of the world. So Newark is on one hand a critical transportation hub for the New York metropolitan area with a major port, airport, and rail system. 
A major center, which many people don't know, of broadband superiority supplying fiber for New York City's financial markets, home to the fifth highest concentration of higher education on the East Coast, with six colleges and universities and 60,000 students and faculty, and to both long-standing corporate headquarters like Prudential and cutting-edge new ones like Audible.com and a remarkable array of thriving small and large cultural institutions, from major performing arts venues to local galleries, with emerging artists telling old narratives to new audiences. Moreover, across northern New Jersey, cities like Newark and Jersey City have continuously welcomed waves of immigrants striving for opportunity, from the great migrations from south to north to the influx of foreign-born families over the last several decades, as the map shows. And there's, so there's a huge surge of human capital there, and there's also a strong surge of real estate development, as the New York City area, as we know, has priced itself out of the market, including so much in Jersey City that they now refer to it as the Gold Coast. And currently, downtown Newark has an estimated $2 billion in corporate and residential development as well. Now, side by side, amidst all that opportunity, educational, business, cultural, human capital, the map of inequality is equivalently stark. With a post-secondary attainment rate for residents of Newark at 17% in the latest count of 2012, compared to a national average of 40% in the latest Lumina reports, a population of approximately 3,800 disconnected youth, those not in high school, out of a high school population of about 10,000. A poverty rate of 28% compared to a national average of 14.3%. High crime rates, homicide 2013 of 33.4 for every 100,000 compared to 4.5 for every 100,000 for the state of New Jersey, and very sparse availability of primary care and healthy foods. 24% um, of Newark residents, for example, in 2013 reported fair or poor health in the past 30 days, and 12% of adults in Newark reported eating less than one serving of fruit and vegetables per day. So of all these sobering statistics are overlaid on a map of disparities in educational attainment, poverty, joblessness, health status, and incarcer incarceration rates that are defined distinctly along dimensions of race and ethnicity. And this is a map that differentiates Newark from neighboring, closely neighboring communities in northern New Jersey, suburbs with white populations of 70% or greater. So, Opportunity rich, inequality poor, side by side. Now, I'm not actually pessimistic about this because the very same map of inequality that haunts us can just as well become a map of opportunity in the context of the power and prevalence of education and innovation in a knowledge economy. And this is the time for higher education, both public and private institutions, to fully embrace its role in affecting that's change, its public mission, its public promise. In this regard, it's actually, I think, quite instructive to think of the echoes of another very divisive period in American history, when Abraham Lincoln and Justin Morrill teamed up to create the land-grant public institutions and the HBCUs as democracies colleges on the principle that innovation, opportunity, and collaborative barn raisings, and let me underline that metaphor, would go hand in hand to rebuild the agrarian industrial economy and educate the sons and daughters of its community. So you had the Civil War period, the height of a divisiveness at that point where, of course, one could argue that issues of race were not being squarely attended to, but what was being squarely attended to was that universities had a role to play 
in creating opportunity and in raising those barns in community. I would argue that what we need is a new moral era, one in which not only all of higher education, but other sectors as well, business, government, nonprofits, community-based organizations, faith-based institutions, band together in a variety of place-based barn raisings to drive change in that opportunity map. We know the dimensions of change that are needed. So if you look carefully, for example, at the Opportunity Index map produced by the Social Science Research Council, based on indices, three aggregate indices of educational attainment, economic prosperity, and civic health for metro regions across America, if we change those, we make real progress. And we also know that very, apparently very small gains in education, environmental sustainability, and economic opportunity can affect large improvements in aggregate annual income in communities. One of my favorite examples of this is really incredibly simple analysis that CEO for Cities, a nonprofit in Chicago, did of the 51 largest metro regions in the United States, a, across those, a 1% increase, 1% increase in post-secondary attainment rates of residents in those 51 largest metro regions would translate into $124 billion in aggregate annual income across those regions, 1% which both tells you the stunning impact of higher education and how far we have to go to try to push things now. So there's work to be done to drive those levers and read the benefits of the talent, green, and opportunity dividends. But there's also a clear map of where we want to get if we have the will to do it. And one can be cautiously optimistic that there is a growing will to do so. And these are just some examples in the post-secondary attainment arena. The collective impact networks that Lumina Foundation is supporting across 75 metro cities to do exactly what CEO for Cities argued for. President Obama's conversations with state and higher ed leaders about college access and opportunity importantly including demonstration pilots on free community college access, and initiatives to re-engage disconnected youth and support educational pathways for re-entry and incarcerated populations. These educational opportunity initiatives are being complemented importantly by broader and sustained engagement of higher education with K-12 in Syracuse and Buffalo, for example, the Say Yes to Education Foundation teamed up with a whole variety of partners, in the, including the districts, to create a higher education compact and intervene in the school districts and free college tuition to any graduate of the city of Syracuse or Buffalo who went to one of 65, I think it is now, private and all of SUNY CUNY institutions. So there are efforts to improve educational attainment and change the economic outlook for so many otherwise abandoned communities. What role can we in higher education play? Before we jump, however, to turn our commitments into on the ground comprehensive and collective impact, we need to both examine our own practices that play some non-significant role in perpetuating, if not generating, the map of inequality itself, and turn to see what our reflection looks like in the public's looking glass. We need to ask what we can do to actively change the view and often the reality held by so many of those left out, disconnected youth, first-generation students at community colleges, undocumented dreamers, residents of long-abandoned neighborhoods, that higher education and the opportunities created therein, particularly by research universities, are for someone or some place else. As we look at ourselves in the public's looking glass, I suggest the three metaphors, the monastery, the marketplace, and the anchor, capture well the varied reflections and suggest some new ways of behaving for higher education. 
For centuries, institutions of higher learning have been purposely constructed as neutral ground, separated enough from the real world so as to allow a group of souls with common backgrounds and commitments to think deeply and freely about fundamental ideas, the monastic metaphor. By contrast, with the advent of technolo technological connectivity and a global marketplace of ideas, education and innovation have become unbounded by place and more transactional in nature, the marketplace metaphor. In turn, and perhaps more recently, as the public calls on higher education to take an active role in helping to build strong communities at home, as the National Issue Forum's conversations across the country have recently suggested, echoes of that moral era resound and suggest a sustainable commitment for local place-based place -based collaboration, the anchor metaphor. While all, each of these metaphors has its purposes, I want to concentrate here on the metaphor of anchors, as I see that model is particularly likely to proactively rewrite the map of opportunity and close the inequality gaps. And if we learn to be good anchors, collaborating with our neighbors, stretching some of our propensity for monastic and or transactional marketplace habits, we may edge closer to enacting the American dream. But to do this, to make the transition from the monastery or the marketplace to a more mutually designed collaboration requires a strong dose of humility and self-reflection, not always common in our midst, as we're much more prone to what I'll call the father knows best model than to the ask us, we lay our heads down here at night. And that's a quote from the wisest grandmother I ever met in the ninth poorest census tract in the United States in Syracuse, who we were asking, what should we work on? And we were doing all this engaged work. And Mary Alice looked at me and she said, Nancy, why don't you just ask us? We lay our heads down here at night. And it was a stunning moment because we all thought we knew exactly what they needed in that neighborhood and we could enact it. And we would have been dead in the water. Nothing would have gotten done because there was a strong legacy and sense of history and pride in that neighborhood. And for all the issues we saw, we missed all the assets that they could talk about. So this distinction was also vividly illustrated for me by a sign in a to-be-unnamed major airport advertising another to-be-unnamed public university's extension service, and by the way, that name is telling in and of itself, as responding with university solutions to community problems. University solutions to community problems. That's not a model that will work to change the map of inequality. Let's contrast that with what Carol Musil at ACNU calls a model of generative partnerships done with rather than done to communities. So if we're going to take on these anchor institution roles, this generative partnership and collaborative network, if we're going to do long-term sustainable relationships with and commitment to community, that is, take on this place-based approach, we really need to understand what it means to be decidedly local, not in a parochial sense, because global networks of place-based anchors are emerging to share best practices and understand the local global resonance in our midst. But yet we really do need to attend to local in a much more nuanced and deep way. Ira Harkavy, Myra Burnett, and I recently summarized the results of several international workshops with colleagues in South Africa and China sponsored by NSF. And the point here was to consider how community-engaged science can simultaneously produce better science 
better societies, and a more diverse and equitable STEM workforce. And clearly, the idea here is that it's a really important recursive relationship. We start breaking into any one of those pieces, and the other ones will benefit. Or consider the phenomenal growth over only six years of the Anchor Institution Task Force, a network of now some 600 members initiated by Ira Harkavy at Penn and David Morasi at Marga, and collaborating locally, deeply locally across this country, but globally with partners in the Council of Europe and beyond. Partnerships are the essence of the Anchor Institution metaphor, as the following quote from the Anchor Institution Task Force mission suggests, and I quote, a flattening, shrinking world has made interdependence a reality of the 21st century. We know that in any major city, wide networks, government, universities, corporations, hospitals, community-based organizations, and others are required to forge a vibrant environment. Strong partnerships are necessary in order to affect significant positive change. And on the ground, as I'll briefly illustrate here with our work in Newark, those partnerships have to be sustained and sustainable well beyond the calendar of any given grant or service learning course. And that will ultimately be the test of our ways. It's going to impact fundamentally on our practices. Not only do we have to learn how to listen and to partner, but we also must support and reward this collaborative long-term work the success of which may be hard to monetize and evaluate. Yet that is what it will take to change the map of inequality and opportunity. So let me return for a final set of moments to my city of Newark, a legacy city of hope and hardship, a city that defines the very notion of survival, about to celebrate its 350th anniversary, led today by an ardent advocate, Mayor Raz Baraka, son of the late renowned poet, activist, and native Newark resident, Amiri Baraki, and grandson of Coity Jones, who migrated from the South to find hope and freedom in Newark. Indeed, this is a city that thrives on never forgetting the stories and narratives of the waves of people coming to find opportunity as illustrated in the many remarkable public humanities projects, shared in public dialogues common to a place that wants to believe in its renaissance, but is forever skeptical and weary of disappointment. So we have remarkable archives of queer Newark, the ways in which the jazz clubs were the sanctuary for Newark LGBTQ waves of generations. We have Curating Black America. Lonnie Bunch came, a, a native Newark resident, came to talk at our Marian Thompson Wright lecture series this year about the ways in which, what it has meant to the Smithsonian enterprise to try to curate Black America. And he said, and we were all sort of laughing, all he had to do was take people to Newark and you would see what that curation was all about. We have our multi-generational, multi-year documentary going on about the newest Americans. These are all students at Rutgers Newark who represent every form of opportunity seeking that you could imagine. In fact, Rutgers University of Newark is a very diverse public research university, a majority of whose students are Pell eligible, many of whom have transferred from community colleges, many first gens, with no predominant racial or ethnic group, really representing the changing tide of what it means to be of Newark and in Newark. And it has a long and deep commitment to this city and the justice that is long overdue. As such, we, we have become an important anchor institution in Newark. And our faculty, students, and staff, many of whom live and come from Newark, take that very seriously. So our neuroscientists work collaboratively with a network of faith-based and community-based organizations in our African-American brain health 
initiative, and in fact, Mark Luck, who got his degree here at Stanford in psychology, runs that, that lab and that clinic with all the faith-based organizations in, in the west side of Newark. Our criminal justice scholars partner with the city, law enforcement, and numerous residence groups on the Newark Public Safety Council. And you can't do public safety in Newark without being deeply embedded in those networks of collective impact. You won't get the trust otherwise, and nothing will change. Our Cornwall Center for Metropolitan Studies convenes over 60 organizations and all the local higher ed institutions in the Newark City of Learning Collaborative to raise that dismal post-secondary attainment rate in Newark to 25% by 2025. Our environmental scientists are rolling up their sleeves with many, many others in land, park, and water restoration. Our business school does the Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development. And it's not your classic accelerator or entrepreneurship program. It's a program to really figure out what it would take to create entrepreneurship as a, as a thematic through the neighborhoods of Newark and into that local $2 billion investments that happen downtown. Our artists and public humanists and creative writers constantly collaborate to tell Newark's stories and reveal its voices and more. And the signature of all of these engagements and the reason I mention them is that we are just a partner in a shared effort. One partner in a shared, widely shared effort. And as much attention goes into nurturing the sustainability of the collaborative infrastructure, which is a very messy and hard and continuous task, as to producing outcomes on any given project. In all of these arenas of anchor institution work, the lesson of Newark is to tread carefully, keep humble, and yet keep going. Always in these collaborations, there's a pitfall that is, once you see it, is so obvious, but that we need to look and listen for carefully. For example, as all the corporate and higher education anchors begin to get together to try to use local procurement from our Newark merchants, we confront what they already know, that there's a real need for capital investments for them to be able to bring their efforts to scale. So we can all commit to local procurement, but if they can't bring their efforts to scale because they don't have the capital investment, it will make no difference that we are doing local procurement and they will fail. As Rutgers Newark builds downtown a 50,000 square foot university community arts collaboratory that we're calling Express Newark, it'll have an arts incubator, a jazz exhibition space, design studio, community media center, portrait gallery, maker space, film production studio. There's both tremendous excitement in the city and the obvious but critical concern of how to ensure seamless transportation from the neighborhoods to express Newark downtown, and as importantly, how to engage and support the many indigenous art organizations in Newark in the process. We can't just build a university community arts collaboratory if we don't sustain the links that create a third space of real collaboration. In the Newark City of Learning Collaborative, for example, addressing the missing infrastructure, such as college knowledge centers and counselors in the public schools, is absolutely critical to any success, regardless of our commitment. We can have all the commitment in the world, but if there isn't a counselor who talks to a kid about filling out that FAFSA form, it isn't going to matter. In our Newark Promise Neighborhood Initiative, it's critical to trace the interconnections across systems that fail children and families. There is nothing that drives me more nuts than the blame the family media line these days. All you need to do is go to a neighborhood in Newark and you know that the interconnected determinants of failure and of the cradle to prison pipeline 
have nothing, almost nothing, to do with the will or lack of will of families. There is such an interconnected web of influence of incarceration rates rippling through these neighborhoods or maternal, the impact of maternal nutrition, for example, that follows kids' school performance years after they're born. So to perfect any particular health, justice, or educational intervention, we have gotta look at all of those together, and you've gotta do it through a web of influence of collective impact. And most profoundly important and so easily missed is the central role that the voices of residents must play in all collective impact work, from public education reform to public safety to public health. And the irony of how easily we forget to include the public and how hard it is to hone the skills needed to listen. And as Harry Boyd says to do, and I quote, work with publics for public purposes in public. As an aside, there's nothing more discouraging than to look at $100 million going into Newark school districts only to realize that the residents feel completely disenfranchised from all that is happening in the change in the district. So it's not that any given school reform effort is necessarily wrong, they're not necessarily right, but they're not necessarily wrong, but if they are not engaging residents directly in those, with voice in those school reform efforts, they'll be useless. So Newark had Mark Zuckerberg's $100 million, and it, I'm sure it did a lot of good. But at this point, what families tell me is they're closing schools near me, and my kid's going to walk across a gangland to get to school? Not going to work. Well, nobody solved the transportation issue when they did the school reform. right? So it's things where you need the public voice at the table. And that's the hardest thing for any of us who think we have the solutions to learn how to do. But I don't want to be negative because, because I really am not negative about it. And the reason I'm not negative is there is such extraordinary talent rising in places like Newark. So you, just as a couple of examples here. We have this incredible not-for-profit called Glassroots that is taking high school kids in Newark who've dropped out or in alternative schools, teaching them glass blowing, and at the same time, teaching them the physics and chemistry and, chemistry and material science of heating glass and what it means, and giving them a credential that then sends them into the glass industry. So it's education, it's art, and it's an industrial pipeline all at once. For a set of kids who otherwise, it is not an exaggeration to say, would end up in prison pretty soon. These kinds of programs can, have, can work if you get the right kind of voices at the table. We did a national summit. Colin Powell has a Grad Nation national summit, and I love the poster from it. Don't call them dropouts. Call them the Grad Nation. The students who spoke from Newark on that, or former students, were the most compelling voices, bar none. All the experts were there, but the students and it's like Mary Alice Smothers, just ask us. We lay our heads down here at night. What we're trying to do at Rutgers Newark is to authenticate that on the ground knowledge by building a new kind of honors living learning community. We'll have about 500 kids when the whole thing is done, mostly from Newark and greater Newark dedicated to the notion of local citizenship in a global world, and valorizing, if you will, what they know about 
what is honorable about their knowledge that they can bring to the table, rather than thinking of honors as defined along dimensions of test scores that they are never going to be honorable on. Think of it on dimensions of urban knowledge that they outstrip any of us in bringing to the table. So it brings me back to Dewey and Prince and Daniel Ahn. It means, as we say when we describe our metaphor for place, we say at Rutgers University, Newark, that it is not just in Newark, it is of Newark. It's not an institution that just happens to be in Newark. It is of Newark, and its identity is defined by the opportunity it can be a part of creating. And that draws us, I think, closer to the looking glass image that Rabbi Prince meant when he defined the meaning of neighbor as not just geographic, but moral interdependence that Danielle Allen alluded to in talking to strangers and that Dewey aspired to as we tend to democracy in each generation. Thank you. Am I supposed to go here? have a little conversation, but uh, we mostly want to have some dialogue with the audience. Um, we have a couple of mics, um, so um, at the appropriate time, you can just raise your hand, a mic will come around, um, and we can have a dialogue. But I get the comfy chair. Thank you. Would you like some water? I'd love some water. <laughs> that was really wonderful. Oh. That was very wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it was wonderful just to hear the word public over and over, <laughs> over and which over, we don't often get to hear here. Um, so one thing that's crossing my mind, uh, thinking about your remarks, is uh, the idea that, um, that more and more people view higher education as a private good, right, as opposed to a public good. And, and there's some convincing evidence of this. First, um, tuition is rising as a percentage of the total revenues of public higher education from 14.5% of total revenues in 1985 up to almost 19% in 2010. Second, the contribution of state and local governments to public colleges and universities is falling. This is the public commitment, right? From 49% of revenues in 1985 all the way down to 26%. It's hard to call some of these public institutions public in that sense. Um, and state support, um, which um, is uh, often more important than broader federal support, um, has dropped dramatically from 42% in 1970 to 22% in 2011. And then if we look at the students themselves, um, in the 2012 National Freshman Survey, 88% of freshmen surveyed said they were attending college to get a better job, and this is at an all-time high uh, from a survey that's been going on since 1966. And 75% said they were attending college to make more money, again, an all-time high. So these figures appear to indicate that the public views higher education, and maybe in particular public higher education, as a private good. That is, higher education's primary purpose is to provide personal benefits to those students who invest in it. So wh what do you make of these trends? What do they say about the public's view of the role of higher education? Um, and um, how do you sort of angle the university amidst that public sentiment? Yeah, so there's a lot there. <laughs> um, so the first thing I want to do, though, is not exempt you privates. So, I mean, I do use the word public all the time, mm -hmm. but it's private institutions are just as much a part of the public map 
of creating public good and arguably could have an even bigger role in doing that given the typical wealth of private institutions compared to, and precisely because of the disinvestment in publics, right? So just putting that to the side, I know you didn't mean that, but just yeah, putting that to the point. side. Um, so the private gain, public good controversy, I think, or pitting is something we have to reframe in the, in the national dialogue because in, in everything I'm talking about, for example, the aim is to both increase the access to the private gain for a larger swath of population, but by doing that, to reverberate and change the public good because the only way communities like Newark are going to thrive is if the next diverse generation gets a leg up in that knowledge economy. So rather than pit private gain and public good, what I've been trying to do is talk to people about the way in which those can work together to really make a difference. And, the, and for me, the real crux comes down to it is not bad to think of higher ed as a private gain machine, but more people have to get in that game. Right? And that's the real problem. I mean, it's scandalous that we are falling in the OECD rankings below a huge number of other advanced economies in, in the percentage of post-secondary attainment of residents of this country. I mean, it's just scandalous. When you think of the diversity and wealth of, pub, of both private and public institutions in this country, the fact that we can't manage, or to say it differently, the fact that a city like Newark, right across the river from New York City, has 17% of its residents with post-secondary credentials, scandalous for a country like this. I mean, so I think part of the problem is, and, and I more and more am focusing on this notion of who's being left out. You know, and part of that answer for that will have to be and should be for institutions for research institutions and four-year institutions to hook up with community colleges. The vast majority of first-generation students will have their first taste in this country of higher education at a community college. And I do a lot of work with community colleges. There are fantastic community colleges in this country, way under-resourced, way under-resourced. But if we want to, for example, change what Charles Blow called the segregation by science, if we want to change that, the best way to do that is to create bridges to baccalaureates from community colleges where you go in and you do STEM training in community colleges and then take students into four-year research institutions. The success rate is phenomenal for that. But we, but we ignore that we have such divides. I'm getting mm -hmm. off. <laughs> no, it, 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 it runs right into my next question, which um, I want you to talk a little bit about, perhaps more directly, about the, the STEM Equity and Diversity Project. Um, um, you showed, a, uh, you talked a lot about different collaborations in the community um, in, in various kinds of ways. Uh, one collaboration, which might be there, but was absent from your talk, uh, was with K-12 education. Um, so if we think about, uh, we often think about STEM production um, as a pipeline that starts in K-12 through um, and folks in higher education often um, lament the fact that, well, K-12 through does a certain kind of job of educating or not educating folks. We do our best uh, with what they provide us. Right, and, and there's sort of a blame game that happens, happens there. So um, from a research university perspective, how do you address that divide between K-12 and, and, and higher education? What does partnership look like, and maybe in particular with regard to STEM? Yeah, so um, first of all, I think you hit 
exactly the, the game. I mean, I, for one, have no patience with higher education saying endlessly, well, they're just not prepared, so that's why we can't take them, and that's why we can't train them in STEM, and that's why, you know. And one of the reasons that I really urge creating this kind of seamless pathway from K through community college to, to a four-year institution is precisely that you're gonna maximize the chances of not losing someone at each stage if all three of those segments are hooked together. So what we're doing, for example, in Newark is the K-12, a lot of our K-12 STEM work is actually starts with Essex County College and Hudson County College going into the district and then takes those students forward to Rutgers Newark or to NJIT, or another neighbor of ours. So to me, what has to happen is not to assume that we can just turn around and fix K-12, but rather to create resources in K-12 that then map right along the pathway. For example, one of the ways in which we lose students from STEM is that we know that math bridge becomes a real issue. Why don't we have free math bridge during summer? So that students are not using up federal financial aid in remedial courses, quote, remedial courses. I mean, one of the real dropout rates is the use of financial aid too early, and then you're stuck. I mean, these are not students who can afford to not be on financial aid. So we've got to find a way to push back. Now, it isn't going to work to just have all the pressure on K-12 teaching. We just know in districts like ours, and we did this in Syracuse, we did this whole wraparound intensive involvement in, in K-12, but we had to supplement that with things at Onondaga Community College in the, in the transition from K-12 to community college to four-year institutions. Necessarily by the details of Obama's proposal on free community college, but at least by the notion that we would take seriously the role that community colleges could play in, in states. And Tennessee is doing a pretty good job with that, mm -hmm. which is surprising. Mm -hmm. At least to me. <laughs> so at, at the end of the day, Rutgers Newark is a public research university. Um, and it doesn't reside in an institutional vacuum. I was able to go onto the website and find on the Rutgers Newark website uh, rankings of every kind of the different programs um, right there on the university website. I didn't do that. <laughs> I take no responsibility for that. So in, in a world where students are viewed as consumers and institutions compete for students, um, how do you pursue all of these objectives, these community partnerships that are not what I would call rankings friendly? Right. Absolutely critical question. I have no answer for that. Um, I mean, I don't have no Just answer. Just do it but, anyway. But yeah, I mean, you know, the only thing I keep sort of thinking, the more demography I read, the more I keep thinking, this is all going to be solved. That, that is, the obsession with rankings is going to have to go by the wayside. Because if you just look, I mean, if you look at Bill Fry's book, you know, the data are absolutely remarkable in terms of how quickly this country is shifting in its diversity. And it is not going to, I mean, at some point, who is going to go to college? What's the marketplace for college? It is not going to be, it is not going to be the students of old. And this country is going to have to stop ranking by the SATs, stop ranking by the amount of money an institution spends per kid or per faculty member. I mean, all those metrics. Even graduation rates, for example, I mean, we have a very high graduation rate relative to our predicted graduation rate for our population. 
But if you just start looking at straightforward graduation rates, which is what, you know, or selectivity rates, what mm -hmm. US News looks at, we won't, you won't be educating our kids. I mean, so, and many of these end up being big stars in this country. So it is not, I'll put our kids up against anyone. And I've taught at all these other kind of places. So, so that question is not about talent. The question is about the cultivation of talent versus the exclusion of talent. And if we don't, who are, who, who's going to go to our places? I mean, the Stanfords of the world will always get its, its group, right? So put that aside. But the rest of the institutions in this country, and certainly the institutions that will be educating the largest share of students coming of age in this country, they're not going to be the institutions that will rank highly on all those rankings. And in many respects, the hardest, there are two constituencies that hold us back, us in general. One is alums who care obsessively about rankings in ways that I've never understood. Mm -hmm. And the other, you know, the other really is the faculty office. And that's a hard thing to say. I'm still a faculty member. I count myself there. But all appearances to the contrary. <laughs> but that is often a group that is very resistant to putting the kind of faith behind these engagement efforts and cultivating. You know, we've lost education as cultivation. I mean, one of the Bill Gates statements I love, and I don't usually love all his statements, was when he said, you know, what is this? Higher ed is a business that takes kids with high SATs, puts them through, and hopes it doesn't make them dumber, and then sets them out? <laughs> you know, it, what kind of business model is that? I mean, and, you know, there's some real truth to it. I mean, it's a, a you know, a straw person argument, but there's some real truth to the notion that what do all these rankings do? They reinforce the divisions that are already in our society. I mean, I have often thought that what affirmative action battles ought to have been about is anti-testing battles, because the, the predictive validity and utility of the 20 points that we used to get screamed at at Michigan in the, in the race gap there, in the middle of the distribution, <laughs> not talking about the extreme, the predictive utility of that is nil, absolutely nil. Yet that becomes the coin of the realm of merit. Right? And we know that those tests, which were once developed in order to free opportunity, now have become an engine of inequality. But that's a huge industry. That'd be even harder to take on than US News and World Report. <laughs> it's endemic. So you said it's you wanted these endemic. lectures to be contentious, right? Yes. So, so I uh, thought I should fulfill my mandate here. <laughs> I have one more question, and I want to be able to open it up to the audience. Um, just so that this idea of um, of, of the role that higher education plays or that a public institution plays with its surrounding community, the idea of, of um, partnerships, of jointly addressing local issues. So personally, where did that mission come from? So as you entered various chancellor or presidential roles, you could have chosen other things, you know, fundraising, uh, putting buildings up on campus, Focusing that. on rankings, where did this come from uh, personally, this particular mission? You know, I think um, probably for me, the, the 
easy but complicated answer to that is that I grew up a kid in New York City, taking the New York City subway 45 minutes to school every day and back. And the entire world was on that subway train. Mm. And the more, the more I went through higher ed as a faculty and, and, and an administrator, the more I realized that as I looked around, the whole world wasn't in our institutions. Mm. And it felt a lot less interesting than those subway rides felt. And I've, I, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and I, when it wasn't gentrified. And I, now my daughter lives there and I go back and I look at the very same blocks where I grew up and I think, like, where are those people that I grew up with? Some of whom I was scared to death of. That's a good thing for a kid to learn. <laughs> you know? and, those people are not in our institutions. I mean, they're just not, you know? Um, All the more so for a public institution. Exactly. I'm not going to let you off the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wanted to make sure we had time for questions. If you have questions, we have microphones. David. Well, well thank you uh, very much for a really provocative and interesting talk. And I just wanted to um, mention or bring up two things. One is I really appreciated your attention to the local, especially as it gives a very palpable and immediate sense of community, which is something I think we need to talk more about. And I'm giving a shout out to the Bog Center in Detroit. And Grace Lee is going to turn 100 years old right. on June 25th. So that's a remarkable achievement. Uh, I wanted to put a plug in for the mon monastic version right. of the university. <laughs> and it's not just because my first job was at Georgetown. Yeah, but but you, you talk a lot about STEM and you talk about um, markers of success being like uh, r um, income, uh, rises in income, which is a good, I mean, it's a fair marker. But I'm also thinking that if we don't inculcate a sense of who we are as a community, then we're just reproducing the basic structure of inequality, right? A few will make it, but the basic structures will right. re remain there. So I really want to put a plug in for the monastic moment in the university, and I want to plug in the humanities because I'm a humanist, right. right? As as a particular, in, particularly important. Um, complement to the STEM fields because that's where we can actually decide, you know, what kinds of research is most humane and ethical, right. what kinds of ways are we going to make use of the profits that we make. So I just wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about that more. Yeah, so that's a wonderful way of saying it. Um, so I actually, despite how it sounds, I don't, I am not putting down the monastic metaphor as much as who's in the monastery. So if we had monasteries, universities as monasteries that were as representative of the communities, the places in which they were located, as the original monastic universities actually were, then it would be very different in my mind. I mean, but the problem is in that they're not rooted, right? So if you could have the kind of freeform flow of ideas that, that that metaphor provides for, but in a context where you had more of the controversy, if you will, of diverse voices at the table, that then I'd be comfortable. Um, so it is sort of a straw person. <laughs> There's a microphone in the back. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for your talk. I'm, a, I'm at the back. Uh, I'm a graduate student in anthropology. My name is Jess. Um, and I wanted to ask you to comment on the relationship between democracy and the corporation and education, because that triangle, certainly as an outsider studying here, doesn't always make a lot of sense. And, and to push you a bit on your definition of democracy, because I feel like in 1937, democracy maybe meant something very different to what it means now. Thank you. So, so let me start with the end of your point um, or question. Um, 
I actually always go back to Dewey because the fundamental aspects in his view of democracy was the associative network of person to person. It actually wasn't the property rights, the voting rights, the individual, what I would call corporatized and individualized version of democracy. So yes, 1937 was quite different, but on the other hand, what he was emphasizing was really, um, he has some wonderful quotes about, you know, the associative network of democracy, person to person, the lived relationships, um, person to person. That's what I was trying to capture there. Um, in terms of the corporatization, um, I have to say I go both ways. Again, it's a little like the private gain, public good thing on that one. Um, I'm actually not someone who believes, I can't, I can't look anyone in Newark, living in Newark, straight in the face and say, we don't need economic prosperity here, we don't need Prudential or Panasonic or Audible or, and you know, so all our work is very much hand in glove with corporate America actually in this kind of work. Um, but again, it, it's the emphasis is on how to skew that towards the public good. Um, and like, like universities differ in terms of how responsible as institutional citizens they are, corporations differ on that quite a bit, I have found. I mean, um, you know, and so I don't take a sort of either or view of, of that. Gabe, you have the mic. I'm always inspired by your speaking. Thank you very much for coming back. Uh, I, I took my sabbatical this year and I actually joined the commission of my county and the purpose of doing it is to learn how county government can actually affect wellness in our, in our group. And one of the things I've learned is that politicians feel that if you only have programs purely in education, that they have no political price, but generally have little impact. And unless we translate change through learning how to write regulation or, in, or learning how to impact legislation, that we're really sunk. Yeah. And, yeah. and they always work under those assumptions. And anytime we, I go to my local legislator, I said, no, oh, we'll do this. They always suggest an educational program. I said, no, 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 let's talk more. I think that we are limited in higher education in the ability to really make social change because we, in fact, don't teach how to write regulation or how to impact legislation well. So, so that's really interesting because in a lot of ways, my experience has in some ways been the opposite of that in that, it, let me just use Newark as an example. City Hall in Newark doesn't have the resources by itself to actually affect change. So th what they have to be, in a sense, is the moral suasion, the convener, the, the pulling together of the anchor institutions, not just education, but all of them, um, to, you know, so our public safety initiatives, for example, and when I say our, I don't mean Rutgers Newark only, I mean, but the whole city's public safety initiatives, they can't, they can't do it on, on their own, right? I mean, the U.S. attorney came to me the other day in, in um, northern New Jersey, and he said, you know, we have this federal reentry program for um, former prisoners, of federal prisoners, and we want to do reentry um, you know, job training, education, health, blah, blah, blah. Well, our parole guys have, have their hands full. They can't do it all, you know. So will you, he says, will you bring together a whole set of, you know, criminal justice folks and social work folks and humanists? He actually wanted a whole set. He wanted our creative writers to get involved. He wanted, you know, a whole set of people to wrap are services around because they just couldn't, and this was at the federal level, but it's similarly true in local government. Um, I find where 
where the legislative part comes in is actually in the state, at the state level. Um, and that becomes a real problem. And I agree there that we need to know more about how to, how to influence that. Um, but local and federal, I think largely what they need to be is conveners of networks of, and we can be a part of that. Does that make sense? Can you hear again? Yeah. So when the Medicare legislation, when the Medicare legislation was written, it was actually written by Phil Lee, who was on our faculty, right. uh, there, was, uh, there was a concern about how to integrate hospitals, because hospitals were not integrated at the time. Right. The person who gave them the solution happened to be a woman intern of Phil Lee's whose name he cannot remember, he cannot remember because I really wanted that name, uh, who said, why don't you tie it to payment? Overnight in this country, based on a simple regulation added to that law, yeah. hospitals were integrated. Hmm. It's, it, you know. Yeah. No, I There's mean, it's a huge impact that it can occur. Yet I don't know that we are placing our students well in communities so that they see the problems from the community side, right? And they identify solutions that are that people in the community just know are there. No, and, okay, and, that and now make I understand them, what and you're saying. Make them, yeah, make the action that makes. Yeah, that now I understand. I'm sorry, I, I missed what you're saying. Yes, that that is I. Absolutely, fully agree. Um, there were, the Times had a really wonderful editorial recently on the on Baltimore, and how the racial construction of housing housing laws, and how those really set the stage for everything that was happening. I mean, not that policing isn't a huge piece, but it was the housing laws that really messed those neighborhoods over long periods of time, um, and we don't know how to do those, right? Yeah, yeah. We have time for maybe one more question. There's a mic on the oh, side. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, hi, Nancy. I wanted to go back to some of the statistics that Anthony started with. And when universities are feeling so relatively poor, there's lack of you know, state funds and pressure to keep tuition down, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, how do you convince administrators to invest like this? Because it feels like it's outside of their mission, I can imagine, and it, it, um, yeah. it's a struggle. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so my answer, partial answer anyway, to that is really the faculty. Um, in all the things I've been involved in, the way in which it survives or fails is whether faculty are deeply engaged in thinking of this work as their scholarship, publicly engaged scholarship on the ground. I mean, um, and then it isn't a side mission. I mean, it's got to be central because there isn't discretionary money to throw at something, right? Um, you know, in Syracuse, for example, one of our best um, um, material scientist was deeply involved in the restoration of a Superfund site with the Onondaga Nation who owned, who, whose site that was and whose history was embedded in, in Onondaga Lake that had to be re reclaimed. And Char by the fact that Charlie was putting his laboratory to that project with the Onondaga Nation was the thing that made it plausible for me to say, as chancellor, OK, we're going to really commit to this restoration. Because EPA wasn't going to do it all, and Honeywell wasn't going to do it all. And, you know. But without the credibility, if you will, of Charlie saying, this is cutting edge work for me. This is what you know, I want to do. It would have been much harder for me as a chancellor to put the resources behind, you know. So I think faculty don't realize how empowering they can be in these situations. I mean. mm -hmm. 
I want to thank you, Nancy, oh, for this wonderful um, discussion. Um, but before the, a final thank you, I want to invite you all to reception right outside, a wonderful reception. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge Hazel Marcus, the director of the Research Institute, um, coordinates all of this, um, and, uh, and Heidi and Evangeline um, help put this all together. It's always a wonderful event um, every year. Um, this one was quite special for me as a higher education person. Um, let's all thank Chancellor Nancy Cantor. Thank you.